So, we data is the name of this talk. It is the opposite of big data. Um, and so, I want to talk about how Mongo can be really useful for applications of any size, no matter how small the data set that you're working with is. Um, and that's basically because um, Mongo ha offers applications the ability to persist data, I mean, and uh, then offline, rather, not inside the scope of the application that you're building, uh, query that data, um, and at the same time, doesn't require you to sort of switch languages, you know, mid code, right? You know, embedding SQL into uh, other code is really a terrible way to go. Uh, and there are other solutions. Um, uh, who's using ORM in an application? Show of hands. Do you guys love ORM? You guys put up with ORM, right? Okay. So, a little bit about me. Um, so, um, maybe I should stand away from the board, right? So, let's see if I can see things from here. Okay, so uh, this is me. Uh, I am a technology innovator. Uh, I like to sprinkle technology pixie dust everywhere I go, sort of the way I put it. Um, and uh, I started my career as a software engineer. Uh, I worked at DoubleClick for a while. Uh, I moved over to ShopWiki, a shopping search engine that I'll refer to later, um, uh, and became a bit after five years, I suppose, the CTO of that outfit. And then uh, for the past couple of years, I've been sort of freelance. Uh, and this is, um, this is what I offer, expertise at the intersection of technology, business strategy, and product formulation. I don't always get the uh, order right when I say it, but it's, um, it's an intersection. Uh, and the stuff that I'm into involves products over technology. I don't love you know, pure technology ventures, uh, although technology is awesome. I'm really into things that you know, delight people. You know, where technology is applied and makes people's lives better. Um, I like uh, user experience testing. Uh, I like being able to watch people interact with applications and have an aha moment. Uh, they were not able to you know, figure out this, you know, this use case. Uh, we'll, have to you know, we'll have to figure out a better way of making it evident to them what they're supposed to do. Um, I like to work with uh, iterative, analytics-driven development. Uh, this was something that I learned at Shopify and um, involves a lot of observing whether users are being satisfied by the thing that you're offering them, uh, and just reiterating slowly on that. Um, and uh, agility. Uh, everyone knows about agile development by now. Uh, when, I was first, uh, when I was first graduating from a CS program, uh, Extreme programming had just had some books written about it, but everyone knows Agile now, right? Everybody? Yeah, right? Are you, how many people have worked on a project that they think is Agile? Maybe how many people have not? Okay, yeah. This is it. Right, okay. So Agile is, I mean, Agile is a thing now, um, and that actually is one of the motivators for projects like Mongo. Uh, at using Mongo in your, you know, in your project because it, it suits an agile development uh, workflow better than um, other sorts of data persistence layers. Particularly now that agility is starting to be measured not in how quickly your release cycle um, you know, how compressed your release cycle is, how, how quickly you can respond to changing business needs, but actually being, actually having your production environment respond to events, spinning up new instances, uh, you know, doing uh, schema migrations uh, live in line. I'll talk a little more about that later. Um, Mongo is, Mongo supports that. Um, now notice I haven't really 
uh, I haven't really talked a lot about big data uh, at all because this, the, the advantages of having a schema-free uh, data layer is, you know, comes to you whether or not you have uh, a terabyte or a megabyte of data uh, because you still have to write the same amount of code to manage the processes when you need to, uh, when you need to go from one sort of version of your data schema to another. Uh, okay, so, so this is ShopWiki. This was my first exposure to uh, MongoDB. Uh, this, is, this is where I first used it. Now, ShopWiki is a, uh, is a shopping search engine. Um, now, when we were founded, uh, well, I wasn't on board when it was founded, but, uh, but I came on a year later. But when, you know, what, what we thought was, you know, uh, you know sh shopping comparison has not been really treated properly yet, and we're going to do it differently. Uh, we're going to be a destination site. People are going to know our names. And when someone wants to buy a digital camera, they're going to think to themselves, I'm going to go to ShopWiki, search for a digital camera, greater than five megapixels, under $200, um, and it's going to come up, and I'm going to, you know, choose the store. It's going to consolidate all of the stores that have cameras based on their thing. And you know, uh, that's not the way it turned out. Uh, it turns out, uh, ShopWiki, uh, which is uh, which still exists and is profitable. Uh, I left a, I think, two years ago, um, uh, is essentially uh, an SEO game, uh, and it's all about getting between a Google search and uh, someone buying something and taking a share of that revenue. Uh, now. In order to go from a startup with very little revenue to making money on uh, this, these rev shares, purely, but with, I mean, the, we don't, you know, if you don't have money to invest in uh, some sort of advertisement to drive traffic to your site, you have to get it naturally, Google. And so our, at Shopify, our consumer was the Google search engine. So we needed to figure out how to do SEO. Now, since ShopWiki is a search-driven site, the pages are infinite. There's no content, per se. Um, and so you, there's no analytics solution that would help us actually, um, that would help us actually gather all of the data and partition the pages into the A-B testing. Uh, A-B testing, anybody, everybody? Yeah, okay, good, okay, absolutely. Um, so, um, so enter Mongo. Mongo is actually a fantastic uh, place to put your roll your own, you know, custom analytics logging data. Because uh, every time you decide you need to add some new field to study, oh, and now we're going to measure how many seconds it took before someone moves onto your page. Oh, and now we're going to count uh, the number. You know, whatever the different. Things that you want to count in your analytics, you just you, you just throw it in your document that logs a page view, um, and you don't have to worry about migrating schemas, right? Doing all these doing all these migrations, uh, taking down scheduling downtime, dealing with uh, dealing with redundancy and all that sort of thing. Um, so it was here that I used um, Mongo for the very first time. It's not a coincidence, actually. Uh, it's not like I just happened on Mongo. Uh, it's because ShopWiki was also founded by these guys. <laughs> so uh, I went to school with this guy. He and I did uh, software projects together. So, um, uh, you know, so when Dwight and Elliot got, you know, tired of doing shopping comparison because they had already done the whole you know, data crawling uh, thing and went on to do Tengen. Bit of history, everyone knows that Mongo was part of a much bigger platform. Yeah, so um, Mongo is just sort of the, the, the data persistence layer of a much more ambitious project that they started. But um, uh, when they went on to, when they went on to do Tengen, uh, they just moved two desk rows behind where all the ShopWiki guys were in the same office, and so we started to use uh, Mongo in a lot of places, possibly, possibly inappropriate places as well. But uh, you know, it, it, we learned a lot about uh, during them. Uh, so, um, 
So that was my first uh, use of Mongo. Now, the, uh, the inspiration for this talk came out of a very different project. Uh, a couple of, I think it was about a year ago, uh, Megan Gill, who is organizing community, uh, asked me if I had a talk to do, and I had already been out of Shopify for a little while. I, I haven't worked with a big Mongo installation forever, uh, but I did actually use Mongo for this project. So this is uh, a website that my parents started um, without having any idea what they were getting into. They knew not the first thing about e-commerce. Um, and like, I don't know, 10 months after the project started and I hooked them up with a, uh, an agency to do design and development of this e-commerce site, uh, they were foundering. They, 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 were so, they, they, knew their, they knew their field. Um, so, Judaica. Um, I'll just give you a very quick description of what this is for those who don't know what Judaica is. Hands up. Actually, most people do, I guess. But uh, Judaica is sort of a sort of a cross between artistic and ritual objects for Jews to use, like blessing cups of wine on the Sabbath Eve. Okay, so uh, the what my parents looked around and saw was that. Uh, basically, everyone is selling Judaica online in crappy mall, like low-end looking sites, and they thought, well, you know, we know artists, we like to go to shows, we can, we have good relationships, we'll, we'll sort of do a boutique sort of thing. Great idea. Like I said, 10 months on, uh, and the site is nowhere to be found, and they can't even communicate properly, so, you know, to the rescue, and off I go to, uh, you know, to sort of take over the entire project and get it launched. Uh, and it's up now, it's good. Um, and it was, it was in this context that I found that I was gonna use Mongo again. Uh, so, uh, but I didn't need it for any of the back end. I mean, there was, you know, we'll go into this a little more, but first I wanna segue into sort of the, the nature of big data, because that's what everyone talks about these days. Um, it's, it is the big, you know, it, it's, it's a big deal. Big, big data is not just all over the tech rags. You'll find it in technology articles in mainstream media. And uh, it is true that big data is going to change the world as we know it. Uh, so who thinks that they're working on big data right now? What are you guys working on? Call them out. Sure. <laughs> okay, how is big data part of your uh, like what, what qualifies your application as uh, big data? Volumes, sizes of the individual artifacts. Uh huh. So what size? What sort of size of data set are we talking about? Terabytes. Terabytes, easily. Okay, so easily terabytes. That's I think where the where the uh, where the big data threshold starts. You definitely have to have multiple terabytes. Does everyone agree with that? Right. Uh, I would stipulate furthermore that you can't, you don't, you don't just need a lot of data to be a big data problem. You need to have a lot of data that you actively touch every single time you do an operation. Um, is you know, data warehousing is old, right? Uh, big data is about, I don't know, like sequencing the human genome. Uh, what else? Who else is doing big data? What you got? We have uh, a sugar for uh, hospitality industry before, and we use it for uh, tweets to get tweets. So, uh, unstructured data basically. It wasn't a lot of volume, but we started to build a foundation hoping on the future perspective. Ah, so this is, uh, this is to my point exactly. Uh, anyone else want to talk about their big data project? In the back. Can you yell out the name of the project again? Trisp. T R I Trist. Um, and can you uh, do you have offhand uh, some data set uh, sizes to quote? Good. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. So, 
so this is so that's a lot of data, but that's not really what people are talking about. I think when they say big data, big data, the change the world kind of big data is uh, was really was really introduced when people found that they could realistically address terabytes of data per operation. Now, this does not come cheaply. Uh, odds are a very small percentage of you will work on really, truly big data problems in the next few years. Um, they are out there. Um, but I think it's worth understanding that there is a ratio of big data projects to the total projects out there. And I'm going to say that that's the ratio. Just putting it out there. Disagreement? How old did you guys work there? Hmm? How, how old did you work there? I mean, a while ago, why did we say it's not Right, exactly. That's a very good question. <laughs> no, this is just, I mean, this is, I'm just pulling it out, but I mean, I, I have yet to, I have yet to talk to someone who is, uh, who is working on, I mean, not yet to, obviously, I think, um, I think, um, I think a lot of the new advertising platforms and, you know, obviously all the so people that are working uh, with social media, but like, all of the social media data at once uh, are working on big data projects, but the fact is, uh, you know, you, you do, I mean, if you work on code, you work on tiny projects all the time. You're always prototyping something new, right? Uh, and there are some projects that are just never going to use a lot of data. Um, and so, I started to think, especially because Megan asked me to talk about Mongo, and the only project that I had at hand to talk about was a little ETL thing that I did uh, for the Penrose project. Uh, this new concept of we data, or we data. Somehow I hear it Scottish, but I can't do the accent properly, but it's, it's we. Um, and it's never supposed to get bigger. Uh, sometimes, you, some, like, uh, like you uh, have uh, a project where you uh, have where you hope that it will grow to be massive, but you know you, the scale is not enormous now. Um, uh, that's one version of this of this problem space where you know you, maybe you're going to grow to be huge, but right now you're not. Um, and another uh, another area of this problem space is the truly small data set size. Um, query performance is not an issue in this case, right? I mean, and uh, I mean. In fact, your whole database might fit in RAM on your laptop or on your phone. Um, it's, uh, you know, this is, it, it, just because your application does not process a lot of data doesn't mean that you're going to write less code to manipulate it if you need to, you know, if you need to do, if you need to do something useful with it. And it doesn't mean that you're not going to benefit from having a super slick data persistence and interrogation layer that offers uh, features over and uh, you know over beyond a, a key value store, um, and that uses semantics that mimics the type of semantics that you're used to using when you code up objects. Right? Documents aren't objects, but you don't need to use a whole toolkit just to persist them uh, to uh, documents. All right. So Mongo, I'm saying, is the solution for this sort of problem space. Um, so it scales down nicely, and by which I mean to say that there is not a lot to do to start working with Mongo as a layer in your application. Is, you know, brew install Mongo, whatever like your whatever your management system of choice is, get it going. Uh, 
the driver for whatever application you're using, and now you're just writing to collections. You don't really have to start to drive out a whole object hierarchy. I mean, you can still write procedural code if you like. Sometimes we do. Um, you don't have to have like a whole, you know, object persisting rule set. Um, so you can access it. You can access it programmatically without using something like SQL. Um, there's a whole generation of developers who have learned SQL as part of their education, uh, either a formal education like I received, where uh, you know where databases were part of the computer science curriculum, and you're going to learn SQL because. Any time you need to write an application that's going to have a data persistence layer that you're going to have custom rolling, which you want to not do, um, you're going to use SQL. But that's just because that was then. This is now. Right? There's, uh, there, there is not necessarily a need for us to mingle SQL into our, you know, into our code, um, nor to think about decomposing your objects or or whatever you're using for your data representation into tabulated um, to relational data. Um, so persistence, that's nice. Uh, you can always look at your data later after you work uh, after you work with it. Um, and uh, and that way and so you can so there you are. Okay, so um, I've alluded to this before. But uh, there exists this thing, ORM, uh, which has been, this has been a thing for, I think, 20 years now. Uh, there, there have been ORM layers. Um, has anyone heard of web objects? That was the first time I encountered uh, an ORM layer. Uh, web objects, I don't think it exists anymore, but Apple was, uh, Apple, I don't know. I think that this came from Next uh, because they, it was the first one of the first application development frameworks uh, for the web, um, and it was first in Objective C, which is now big again because people are doing iOS development, um, and uh, then they ported it to Java, and that's when I met it. But obviously, the uh, for those Rubyists out there, Active Record is the is the name of Note, uh, and Okay. I mean, it's a solution, right? If you have to persist your data, and the only thing you can persist it to is an SQL, so a relational database, great. You have you have Active Record, and I'm not going to trash talk Active Record. It's pretty cool. I'm down with it. Um, who loves Active Record out here? Anyone? <sighs> cricket, cricket, cricket. But it is good. I mean, it's uh, there. I think they're uh, they're. Their big thing is, and it goes along with the whole Rails methodology, is uh, convention over uh, configuration, I think is the idea. Um, I haven't worked with it on enough projects extensively enough to sort of rattle off examples of how it is nifty, but it is one of the better options if you want to have an ORM layer. Um, it is not a solution to, uh, it, by any means, to the problem of needing to kickstart your project and have some, you know, data schema that you can, you know, effortlessly maneuver around. Especially if you're hoping to grow your project uh, from wee to mid-sized, right? Like, harking back to that, uh, to my claim that these days agile means agile in production. Um, let me just. Uh, Relate a little anecdote about a year and a half ago. Photo Bucket, I think his name, uh, the company, did a talk for the Mongo user group. Uh, does anyone here remember that talk? They talked about their migration from relational database to Mongo, and uh, they did something that was pretty clever. Uh, all they did was they wrote code that looked up users' records uh, in Mongo, and if it didn't found, find it there, they copied it over. Uh, and then when they had done that for like several months, they ran a batch script to uh, sweep up all the stragglers, you know, and they're done. Um, that's, a, that, that's a live environment. Uh, we prefer doing this sort of thing to scheduling downtime or partitioning your application even worse uh, so that you can have one running while you do the migration and then some sync up that happens afterwards, disaster. Okay, so 
you know, ORM gets you uh, mi migrations. Uh, that's a thing. Uh, does that, uh, Active Record has this thing called migrations, where you where you actually specify every time you update a schema a way of translating uh, the former schema to the to the new schema, and it's got a version so you can apply schemas. It's very it's very good. It's a nice way to handle the fact that you will have to update schemas if you're working with ORM. Uh, but personally, I think uh, a better solution to this is documents, where the documents are versioned if you care about the schema. right? If you don't want to interrogate the document to see if they have an attribute that you care about, you can actually just version them. And you know, uh, fitting into this agile in production motif, uh, I would rather have a library uh, interrogate documents as they come out of the database to find out what they, uh, you know, whether they are delinquent and require updating and calling hooks to update them as that's happening, uh, than actually migrate data on mass, uh, which is which is what you're going to do, get if you work out with uh, with ORM. Uh, so in short, I don't, you know. ORM is, or is no substitute for actually using um, a layer that utilizes the right semantics uh, and maps more properly to your to just native application development. Okay, so this brings me back to this project, right? You guys heard of mom and pop shops, right? This is literally my mom and pop shop. It was not an easy project to work on, I have to tell you. I have to tell you. Um, and it was very clear from the very beginning that uh, that they would not be working with the e-commerce backend. Uh, they, I couldn't even trust them really to submit spreadsheets with product data filled in without them, for some reason, altering the the, the, the column headers. Uh, you know, sometimes it's. You know, product name, sometimes it's name, sometimes it's, you know, merchant price, sometimes it's merchant cost, like, you know, why? Just leave it alone. It's still the data. Um, so, you know, but, you know, mom and dad, that's what you want. So, uh, you know, there were certain things that were already set by the time I came to this. Like, for example, I wasn't going to be the one to develop this e-commerce shop. I did uh, hook them up with a, a designer and a developer who specialized in some e-commerce stuff, and he chose Magento, which is written in PHP, or go, I wasn't going to be touching it. Um, and, uh, you know, and, he, and, and he had already begun work on customizing it, and he had built an uh, extension to the bulk uploader that accepts CSV documents. Um, so there was sort of a workflow dictated already. Um, and it was into this environment that I came and wrote a bunch of code to handle this. Now I'm going to make a quick little segue uh, to talk about how I started to rewrite this code using um, control slideshow. Wake up. Behavior driven development. Okay. So behavior driven development is a super cool idea that I cannot vouch for how well it works. And I was hoping that I would be able to talk to some of you guys who have actually worked on behavior driven development. Uh, projects after the talk. I'd really like to hear from you guys. Um, but I encountered this uh, concept uh, during yet another one of my forays into a Ruby on Rails tutorial. Um, and, uh, and it was a very, very appealing concept. Behavior-driven development. Okay, uh, what is it? So it's an outside-in approach. That's one of the phrases they use frequently. Just to say that, you know, Again, Agile is not what it used to be. Where, you know, there, was, there was XP back in the day, and there's like Scrum, and now Kanban, and all these other things. And it's, there's sort of a family of Agile practices. And test, you know, behavior-driven uh, behavior de development is a layer on top of test-driven development. You know, the same way all of these new Agile processes are layered on top of the original um, credos of um, test-driven development. Okay, so outside in from a test-driven development approach is we write the code to test the code we're going to write before we write the code. 
we watch the test fail, and then we make the test pass by writing the code. And we know we're done when the tests are passing. Uh, and this is a, and, and for this you get, not, you get both a specification for your code and also regression tests. Everyone's on board with this, right? Okay. Um, so behavior-driven development goes a layer out and talks about acceptance uh, tests um, for larger features. There's unit testing for methods and objects, and then we have a behavior test for the functionality of the program. Um, and it's important to note that from this point of view, everything is behavior. Uh, the fact that an ATM cash machine dispenses some money and debits uh, and, deb and, and subtracts an amount from your account when you request money is behavior. And also the fact that some method takes two arguments and returns a Boolean is also behavior. Um, it's all behavior. Um, okay, so the, the next facet that I thought was really interesting uh, and, and, gets, and, and begins to illustrate the magic of this approach uh, is the notion of acceptance test driven planning sessions where uh, all of the stakeholders in a project get together, uh, the business analyst, product owner, uh, manager, the project manager, QA engineers, and the software developers who are gonna be working on the project. They all get together during planning meetings. Is this how you guys do it? You guys get, you know, the guys who want features in the same room as the developers who are going to be delivering them, right? When you guys have meetings. Who works in sprints? Who works in sprints? Ah, not enough of you. Um, uh, so sprints begin with planning meetings. You have a backlog. You know, you take, your, you, take your, uh, you take the features off the backlog. You agree that we're going to work on these things for two weeks. Then you work on them. Uh, there's gonna, there has to be a meeting where you discuss how the features are going to work. And in behavior-driven development, in that meeting, uh, you are working on developing what they refer to as a ubiquitous language. And this is an ex I, I'm, I'll bet that some of you have been frustrated while working on projects because among your teammates, you're using a certain set of vocabulary to refer to um, to refer to the concepts that drive your application. And then you go into a meeting, and the salespeople are using completely different language. Uh, and so, you know, what happens when you, uh, the one uh, engineer on your team with social skills, gets sent off to uh, uh, a client? You know, you put on your, your best cargo shorts and uh, you know, and, and you wind up with a sales guy, and you guys are just talking across, like the you know, customer is just not impressed because you guys can't seem to use the same words to talk about things. It's confusing, and you know, you're not all oriented productively towards the same direction. And uh, you know, this miscommunication can be a really rough thing uh, for any team. Uh, obviously, to some extent, it's just a matter of culture, but there are definitely bugs that come out of, you know, well, I mean, we're talking about you know, depositing and withdrawing, but really it's debiting and crediting. All withdrawing actually means that you do something physical, but indebted is something that happens to a register. I actually don't work in finance, so I don't know if this is true, so I'm just making this up. But those are the sorts of areas where like bugs can creep in. So ubiquitous language, acceptance, uh, acceptance, acceptance test driven development, uh, uh, with driven planning, where everyone gets together, uses their ubiquitous language to specify the behavior of software before we go ahead and even begin to write the unit tests that are going to test the code that we're going to write later. And in order to support this, uh, in the Ruby world, we use uh, a tool called Cucumber. Uh, hmm. I wonder if there's a way that I can make this a little more visible. Uh, I have blow-ups. So Cucumber is a, is a language. It's a, with, a, with a limited grammar that reads like English, uh, where you specify the behavior of software. 
So here's the top of a cucumber. Here's the, the, the first thing in a cucumber is, uh, is a feature. You describe it. It's got a name. Here's part of my Penrose project. The CSV converter handles XLSX files. Uh, and the, the description over here is something called Connextra format, I think. It doesn't have to be in this format. This is free form. But it happens to be that in this world, and again, I'm, I'm not a guru of this. This was, I used the Penrose project as a learning opportunity to pour over the RSpec and the Cucumber book and you know, hung out on the IRC channels and trolled Google and everything for this. But you know, basically, this is a, a means of organizing your thoughts about, uh, about specifying features such that you're always emphasizing roles and value. So in order to upload products to the e-commerce site, as a Penrose administrator, I want to convert XLS files to CSV. And that is the, an, an advisable way to think about specifying the way software behaves. Because you're always concentrating, now you can invert it. I, uh, as a Penrose administrator, you, know, you might want to sort of flip it around. Depend, you know, some people advocate other ways of talking about this stuff, but... Um, I think the canonical example was um, if you're building a travel site, right, and you want to specify features for it, uh, how much different is it uh, when you say, well, as a professional business traveler, in order to book a flight, right, uh, you know, your features might be different than if you are a occasional for, you know, a traveler who doesn't travel for business all the time. So that's this is a you know an important planning tool uh, is thinking about things in this way. Uh, the the rest of the cucumber file is broken into some some more um, rigid descriptions. These are actually part of the grammar. First, you specify scenario. Here's a scenario: a valid XLSX file given a valid XLS file with the contents. And here you see that one of the features of Cucumber is that it allows you to specify tabular data. That's going to be passed into code that actually executes. Um, when I invoke the CSV converter on the file, then it should pass, which is code for zero exit, uh, zero exit status, with, and then, you know, a block of quotes. So these are, um, so these are conveniences for referring to the way software behaves when you invoke it. Here's a little tag so that when you run your Cucumber suite of features, uh, you get, you can sort of limit it to, for this is a work in progress tag. Um, so, and then here are the step definitions. Separate file, these things are mapping regular expressions that match step definitions. So this is a given that a valid XLS file with the contents and the table that was defined over here is now bound to this variable, and I can play with it, and I can uh, assign it to a uh, to an instance variable that this code executes in the context of uh, an object with, which will take this, uh, and I can set the test file name and cr create using a little helper class uh, at the XLS file with the data that I specified in the table, and then. You know, here's another step where I'm verifying uh, that uh, uh, the CSV file contains the same data as the uh, XLS file contained, and that's and that's specifying features. Okay, your inner layer uh, in the Ruby world uh, is RSpec. There are lots of spec libraries, and they consist of uh, the following components for working on software. Okay, first. Specification, uh, how you uh, how methods should behave, and then in order so okay actually I want to know how many people are familiar with object doubles, method stubbing, expectations, and th things of this nature. Okay, some of you guys. Now before I drag this on anymore, I'd like to know how many people are interested in hearing more about how you can test code using these things. All right, I'm gonna not enough. I'm gonna, well, put them up if you really. Uh, let's, um, let's, let's talk about this afterwards. I'm gonna get on with it. Uh, this is what our spec looks like. Um, and you can find more info over here. 
um, I want to get to the sort of the, the the example here. So here's the so here is the example that inspired this whole discussion of why Mongo is useful for projects with a tiny data set size, right? It's the Penrose ETL pipeline, extraction, extract, translate, and load, which is essentially what we need to do with spreadsheets to get them into uh, an e-commerce site. Now, when I came on the scene, I mentioned that uh, Greg, the developer of the uploader, the bulk uploader, had created something that was going to read in CSA files, uh, and that was that. Uh, that was how it was going to work. Um, so, okay, good. My parents could probably save uh, Excel files as CSV, but it's dicey. I mean, there are a couple of different CSV formats. I can't necessarily rely on them. Um, so, we're going to work with product spreadsheets. Um, but products need descriptions, and there's just no way that they're going to type multi-line descriptions into Excel uh, cells. Uh, I would get a call literally every day uh, asking for a reminder how you insert a new line into an Excel cell. Um, not to mention that's a shitty way to work. I mean, you don't want to do that. Um, so there was going to be blah, 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 exquisite craftsmanship product description files formatted separately. Okay, so now the shape of the problem is beginning to emerge. We need to get these product descriptions merged with the specifications for the product products built into a CSV file so that it could be uploaded. Okay, so to do this in memory, uh, there, there's no reason why I, why I couldn't do that. Uh, but thinking things through a little more, I mean, this is going to be this is valuable data. Metadata is available from this uh, for all kinds of business intelligence, right? So, enter Mongo, right? We uh, we turn product spreadsheets into intermediate CSV, load it into Mongo. Documents for each product, categories, arrays of you know arrays of uh, of uh, attribute categories, comma separated uh, in the uh, in the Excel spreadsheet turn into an array of category names uh, as an attribute of the document. Database, product descriptions, run a mapper, finds the name, goes to the artist, you know, links it up all in the database. And then I can export this again to CSV and upload it to the website. Uh, but I can also do this. And this is just a little preview of the Mongo aggregation uh, operators that have been introduced in 2.2, I want to say. Uh, anybody? Anybody? Yeah. Yeah. Look it up later. Yeah, it was recent. It was recent. This did not exist when Chopaki was using uh, Mongo. That's which is why we did a lot of like um, you know export to SQL summary tables. But um, should we buy AdWords for uh, you know Hanukkah's coming up? And uh, and uh, people want to buy menorahs. Um, well, should we buy the silver menorah keywords? Well, you can do that by running aggregation on the data and finding out how many there are. If you have two of them, it's really not worth advertising to drive traffic to your site for two products, but if you have lots of them, then, then good. Now this is only one example of that sort of thing. Now, this is the template for the We Data project. It is a project where you have some data. You're going to mingle it with a couple of sources. Now, pre-Mongo, you would do that in memory, do whatever you want and you just have to run that every time. So there's this, as your data may grow, it's gonna get a little slower, you know? uh, but if it's really small, it doesn't matter. But it doesn't have a life beyond that mo you know, ephemeral moment where you actually get your, you know, run your query. Uh, with, with this sort of structure, you now have the ability to interrogate this data uh, for whatever you want without having to constantly 
you know, rerun imports. You can do diffs. You can you can uh, you know you can find out um, you can do uh, how many you know we, we, two, the descriptions are too short. And I want to rewrite all the descriptions that are under like fifty characters. I want more content. Beefing up these things. And you name it. Sky's the limit. Like the you know when once your data is sort of mingled. Uh, and persisted, you, uh, you, know, you can do whatever you want with it. And that is really the essence of, uh, of the lead data project. So there you go. Thank you. <laughs> Questions, anybody? <clears throat> Uh, you say you, you interface Mongo with that uh, software package, the e-commerce software package, which was like the MSSQL. Ah, okay. So the question is uh, the, 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 the integration between Mongo and the e-commerce package. There was no direct integration. Uh, the e-commerce package runs on, oh, actually, I'm going to do this live um, just so that you guys can see the difference between uh, what happens. Um, This is the data schema. Oh, whoops. This is the data schema for uh, uh, for Magento. It's uh, look at look at that. This is ridiculous. Uh, th th this is what happens when you have to use ORM for your uh, for your application. Don't do it. Yeah. What's that? Don't use Magento. Yeah. Don't, yeah, don't use Magento. That's another thing. But like, I mean, this is inevitable. This is absolutely inevitable. Uh, if you want to use a, uh, 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 an ex flexible, extensible uh, thing that combines uh, both content management and, uh, and arbitrary uh, uh, content types, in this case, the content would be products for sale. You know, you you cannot get away from having uh, these ridiculously exploding, uh, you know, decoupling structures in uh, relational tables. That is why Mongo exists is to get us away from that nonsense. Anyway, so no, there was no direct uh, integration. Mongo was being used purely as my playground to take data from a couple of different places, a description file and multiple different uh, Excel spreadsheets that contain product data, mingle them, and then do you know offline queries, whatever I wanted to on them. Uh, answer your question? So, so you came in with what, a, a MySQL UBC to Mongo? Uh, no, no. Heavens, no. How did you connect to the database? To Mongo? Or the database? To the, to the oh, this thing. Yeah. Ah, I didn't. <laughs> Um, I didn't. Uh, Magento has um, an API that I am sure the developer who I uh, outsourced the work to customize the back end of Magento uh, used to take CSV data and insert them into uh, the, this MySQL database. Uh, I didn't touch it at all. And it was, it was sort of, they were separated layer wise by a. Um, by an uploader process written in PHP that lived on the server that would suck in the CSV data that I produced and would insert products into the database via Magento APIs. So I that's just, I the same thing. Yes, it sucks, right? So because they, they're not in one table, they are yeah. the tables. It's ridiculous. You have to insert all the one product, you have to insert the tables. Right, uh, exactly. And the first thing I have to do is I have to insert from the instance we have my SQL. <laughs> yeah. Any other questions? Yeah. So uh, why was MongoDB a good choice versus something like Elasticsearch or Solar ah, or Couch or something like that? Okay, so uh, Couch, Couch, Couch. Um, couch does not have aggregation, uh, does it? No. Yeah, Couch doesn't have aggregation. It doesn't have features. It's a key value store. Um, the, 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 the essence of what I'm trying to communicate is exactly that. that a Mongo is a general purpose solution uh, that it uh, offers features, it emphasizes features 
and try to, uh, and, and this is actually, in your, you should listen to uh, Elliot talk, uh, I mean, there's videos available uh, about that, that, that design principle where they're trying to balance uh, speed uh, with features. And there are a lot of uh, projects out there that have decided they're gonna do one thing and do it well. They're gonna be uh, uh, pure in, you know, mem they're sort of memcache, RabbitMQ, all these solutions that involve creating really rapid synchronized data structures that you can insert, pull out of, and everything, but they don't offer any, they don't offer any, uh, you know, features where you can say, well, I wanna work with the data, I want it to, I, I wanna, interrogate it in a certain way. I want to do queries, I want to match against it, I want to filter, I want to do aggregate, I want to you know, partition, um, and, uh, you know, and have it be persistent too. Um, elastic search, I mean, I think that's just overkill for, for trying to get, um, for trying to get um, uh, you know, uh, Excel sheets to be merged with some, uh, some free text documents that describe products, and that's, the same rationale that I would use to say that ORM is overkill to do stuff like that. It's like I didn't even want to write, uh, you know, later I went back and rewrote uh, some of this code to be object oriented so that I could play with the behavior driven development stuff that I was going on about. Um, uh, but I didn't even want to write objects. So, like, why, if I'm just doing procedural code, how am I going to use ORM, which is mapping objects uh, to, to tables? It's a, uh, you know, there, there's too much overhead. There's too much configuration. You, you know, you got questions about like, oh, uh, you know, what happens? How do we how do we set up cascading deletes as far as key relationships? So it's like, no, just you know, I just want to take data the way I see it, like collections of attributes and hatches and arrays, like um, our uh, uh, what was his name? I'm sorry about that. Ryan uh, mentioned uh, is just the way to think, you know, we're thinking about data now. Um, okay, was that a good answer to answer your question? Any other questions? All right, well, I want to thank, uh, you know, about.com for hosting us.